Today's about unplugging from limiting family self-sabotage patterns. Chris Dunganier, founder of the Conscious Education Podcast. This is a live session filmed in our Magnetic Mind Masterclass, which is a coaching program. If you hear me uh, referring to some of the guests or talking to people, this was recorded when it was live. And so you're not able to uh, comment or chat uh, to me, obviously. Enjoy this session and uh, do subscribe or share it if you think it's valuable. Bye for now. So today's a great topic and we're going to have fun. So I'll get right into it. Today's about unplugging from limiting family self-sabotage patterns. See, your current reality is created by your unconscious. Actually, there's nothing in your current reality that isn't a, a creation. And uh, I had a, I've had a lot of experience with, with people replicating what they had created or, or born into in childhood in an attempt to finally overcome it. And it's very strange and it's it's really weird how we never let go of some of these orientations and they seem to follow us around. But if you've ever been trying to create something and for some reason you just can't get it, today might be the session that helps you to really understand why. For me, when, when I went through what I'm going to take you through today, I couldn't understand why I wasn't able to hold on to success until I realized that if I was to have success, it would, there was a part of me that felt that I was outshining my father and I didn't want that. So I would have success only for as long as it felt safe and only as big as it felt that I wasn't outshining him, but then I would lose it. And there was this weird sense of, of relief when I got to then explain how I lost it and how I needed to go get it again. And it was an unconscious relief. And it was like, why do I feel a part of me is relieved? And why do I feel so stressed when I have it? You know, I would create success and be so scared of losing it. It was like that, that consumed me. And, and when I did some of the processes we'll do today, you, you'll see it. I remember I was working with a client many years ago now, and she couldn't hold on to money. And we did the process we're gonna be doing today. And what we found is that it had everything to do with her grandmother. What was interesting is that her grandmother was uh, lived through World War II, and uh, she actually had a, uh, a husband in a different family before the war, and they were doing really well. They had lots of money, and then they were persecuted because of their money and attacked, and that whole family died. She remarried, which became this lady's family. But there was this unwritten rule that having money was scary, and the whole family followed along that pattern because everyone is born into a certain family. And that certain family is run by certain individuals, certain parents who were brought up in a certain family, who learned ways of being from a certain family, from a certain group of individuals. And so these threads of emotional pain run through these unspoken what's allowed and not allowed. It's fascinating, fascinating to me that at 21, I snapped my thigh and nearly died, that my father also had uh, leg injuries that kept him safe, but my grandfather didn't have to go to war because when he was the exact same age that I was when I broke my leg, he didn't have to go to war because he created a leg injury. Fascinating. Repeating cycles, cycles of information just flowing through generations and generations and generations. We code up our reality between ages of zero and four. Then we become parents repatterning the ages zero and four to our children. So this lady had no idea. We found it. We found different ways to honor her grandmother. We created a shift and she was able to keep and hold on to money. I haven't spoken to her for years. The last time I did, uh, she was she was doing very, very well. Last week, I was speaking to a client. This client had a health condition that she couldn't shift. And once we investigated and understood, why is it that she keeps creating this health condition? Why would that be the choice? Out of all possibility in all, all of the universe, why would she continue to create this health condition? We unpacked it and looked at it, and my intuition said it was her father. I did an intuitive reading. I said, it's your father. She then said, wow, it is, because... My dad had same health problems as this, 
and he died early. And I said, so what is it? Why would you want to keep doing it? And what we realized is that the reason that she kept on creating the health and the illness was to honor her father. Something along the lines of, dad, because I love you so much, I will have the same life experience as you. Dad, because you are in so much health pain, I will have that too, to honor and to belong to you. Now, it's far too soon for me to acknowledge how much shift happened, but those of you who are on that call last week know the session and, and know it. It was a powerful session. Some people were here and, and to respect the, um, uh, respect the person, we're not going to share names and stuff, but, but you know, that was a very, very, very big session last week. And then uh, another recent uh, situation that's happened was uh, another individual, she couldn't create, and again, uh, this was around money, she couldn't create more money. And every time she went to grow her business and create more money, it would always, it, it would always end up in relationship problems with her husband. And once we've unpacked it, we've realized that the only way that she received love, she received love by being the person getting provided for financially. That's how she felt love. Uh, when she grew up, her parents would look after financially, but they were never there. It was the, here's money, here's this, I will look after you. So every time she went to make money, unconsciously, there was something missing. Why is there something missing? There's something missing. I have no way to create or feel this love. And so these patterns are there. They, they, they sneak around in the background in our system and you see them. Once you, once you do some of the work we're going to do today, you notice them. I want you to get this. There's absolutely, oh, there's Medi. She said it's okay to share. So that the health example was Medi and she's, she's here. So Medi, I hope that it's been a great week since that session it was a brilliant session. I didn't ask, I didn't ask her permission. So I, I wasn't going to share who it was, but it was Medi. Now Medi's here and she said, say my name. So it was Medi. Well done, Medi. It was a great session, wasn't it? It was a great session. So here's what we've got to understand. The unconscious uh, the subconscious, whatever you choose to call it, we call it the unconscious. The, the unconscious seeks survival. It seeks to keep the body alive. Whatever you want to call it, the reptilian brain, the critter brain, you know, when you look at it, the limbic system, it wants to keep this body vessel alive. That's its goal. Get the right food, the right oxygen, the right water. Its, it's whole outcome is to keep, keep you alive. So what's interesting is that whatever it survives, Whatever the unconscious survives becomes the circumstances, conditions, and feelings the unconscious searches out even more to survive. For example, if a child experiences toxic, toxic shame, like if a child is shamed, like really shamed and really toxic, lives in shame. What's interesting is when you feel it, you feel like you're losing, you're being shamed, there's something wrong. There's something that's not right about you. But you don't die. You don't perish. You're not dead, you see. And so what happens is, is that you survive. Even though the toxic shame hurts, you survive, okay? Now, survival gets learned that in order to survive, I should find places to feel shame and then not die from it. It's really crazy to consider. The brain looks for that circumstance again because it knows it can survive it. So this is really interesting. From the unconscious, it says toxic shame. I can live through that. Abundance, I have no idea if I can live through that. But toxic shame, I can. You see that? I can survive that. I've done it before. So why would I test out this other thing? See, I've already, I already know I can outrun a lion. Why would I try to go over here and, and just sit around by myself? I don't know what's available there. And so what happens is, is that the thing that you, you the, the, the environment becomes the thing you search out in yourself and in others. And if it's missing, 
it feels like there's something wrong. So if a person grows up in a family where they wake up and knock people on the head with a hammer, they knock people on the head with a hammer every morning. Hello, welcome, welcome to the day. Boom. Good morning. Boom. Knocked on the head with a hammer. Boom. Then they become an adult. They go stay at a, a friend's house. They wake up. You don't hit. You don't hit each other on the head with a hammer here. No. Oh, so they go back home, they wake up, bang, they get older, they go, hey, you know what, we don't have to do that. I've been to other people's houses, I've watched them. You don't actually, hey, mum, dad, you don't actually have to do that. So then they get older, they grow up, and then all of a sudden they feel like, oh, there's something missing in my life. There's something, there's something missing. And so they might grab a hammer themselves. They might find a way to, to knock it against the wall, but they'll find a way to create the experience that they know they can live through. Because the unconscious knows that's survivable. You can take hammer, you can take skepticism, you can put it there, you can take scarcity, you can take overthinking, you can take um, being belittled, you can take abuse, you can take whatever it is. And at every single scale that you could ever imagine. If you do not die, the unconscious knows it can survive it. So it will keep searching it out. And anything that's not it is completely... Uh, uh, to, a, to a, a factor of infinity, uh, more risky to the unconscious. And so it's very interesting. And, and so here's how it works, okay? So I've got a little four-step little system here uh, that I'll, I will get uh, Mel's to, to type in if she can. I'll put it in as well. I've got a little four-step system of how this, how this kind of plays out. So the survival of the safety pattern, it kind of works like this. The, uh, the child's, child's brain encounters some sort of threat to belonging, some sort of dad's not seeing me or mom's not giving me praise, some sort of threat. There's some sort of threat to their belonging or their safety. And it doesn't even have to be a real threat. It's a perceived threat of, of a three-year-old's worldview. You know, picking a daisy flower and her parents saying, don't do that. Don't pick a daisy. Oh, I'm bad for, for beauty. Beauty is bad. You see, it's a three-year-old coding it up. Some sort of threat from a three-year-old's perspective. Now, the child cannot fight and it cannot flee. The child can't. Imagine your three-year-old self. You can't do anything about it. You can't run away. You can't fight it. So if you, if you cannot fight and you cannot flee, but you do not perish, you do not die, what happens? You survived it. You survived it. So all you know is I survived that. I survived it. That's the only information that makes sense. Can I get a yes in the chat box? Does this make sense? The only thing is, is I survived it. That's all they know. I survived it. So step three on my little system, Mouse, would you would you please um, post it in again? Thank you. So step three is the threatening experience becomes an essential element in not perishing or not dying. The threatening experience becomes an essential element. Hmm. Abuse becomes an element of survival. Judgment, overthinking, hating ourselves, being critical, it becomes an essential element in survival. Think about it. Because I've, I know how to play this game, I'm going to keep finding ways to play this game. Because this game I have lived through, so I know how it works. It might hurt. It might hurt, but I, I can survive it. That one over there, I have no idea. So then this creates a condition in which our system values the threat as a key ingredient in our survival. 
we'll post all four um, of my, my little steps here. What I'll do is I'll, I'll screen share my notes if uh, anyone wants to take a quick screenshot. Quick, take a screenshot, grab him. Three, two, one, someone would have got him. They're all getting posted in there. Brilliant, okay. Someone's got you. If you haven't got them, someone on here has organized it for you and there they are. Okay. We'll add it to the replay. If you didn't get it, get on Mighty, someone will get it to you. Now, isn't that interesting? Step four creates a condition in which our system values the threat as a key ingredient to survival. Now, uh, you know, many years ago, I did some work that was in family constellations. Uh, thank you. Who, who got a screenshot and is, uh, is able to help everyone else and, and, um, or has written them all down? Yeah, cool. How, Kate, lots of people have got it, guys. So ask and mighty. You're going to be looked after. Hey, can, we'll all just, I just want to keep moving. You'll all be looked after. No problems here. So just go, we'll go post them in Mighty after this. My team's got it as well. Okay. So uh, uh, quite a long time ago, about 2013, I came into uh, some work by the name of Bert Hallinger. And, uh, and th this, is, this is some very, very, very interesting work. Has anyone done any family constellations uh, uh, before? Yeah, anyone done any family family constellation work, Bert Hellinger? Some of you? Yeah, cool. Okay, if you haven't, uh, Bert Hellinger is an amazing man, and uh, I, I'm not pronouncing his last name right. Uh, I've tried to before, and I'm, I'm no good at it. And uh, you know, German German gentleman, and uh, an amazing, an amazing, an amazing piece of work around family ecology. And he, he identified that there is seven generations of family patterning present in the individual. And it makes sense, okay, is that what is learned by the parent should get passed down to the child. That makes sense. The problem is, is if that parent or grandparent uh, passes down learnings that are in a contradiction to what the new, the individual now wants to create, and and it's very fascinating to to witness this and to consider your own patterning that might be there. The way that I uh, love to explain it is that it's every single one of us grow up with parents who are probably between the ages of twenty and thirty, right? Still figuring out life. And we look, and those those parents we look up to, and we learn about life from them and what's going on from them, and we code up our reality in ages zero to four, and we make up things that don't even make sense. Then we grow up and learn what we learn there from zero to four, and we become adults, we become parents, and then we, acting out our uh, egoic agendas, do our best job as parents as well, and all of us do our best, most imperfect job as we can. And then our child's receive it in a completely imperfect but perfect way. And these, these things get passed through. And then the, the challenge arises is that we have this need to, to create belonging. And any way that we feel that uh, we don't have belonging, birth order is very important as well. Uh, any way that our uh, unconscious codes up that we lose safety or belonging with the tribe is a big threat to ex experience. So here's a really beautiful statement that I love uh, straight from Bert, which is, in a family of thieves, in a family of thieves, the child who does not steal has the guilty conscience. That's a fascinating statement. We want belonging because it's, you know, we must survive. We must make sure that they are going to look after us. We must belong to whatever tribe we're born into. And what's interesting is we, as children, are compelled by love and fear to belong with and honor our parents. And this obligation to honor and belong one's family is actually enforced neurologically, bio, biologically. It is not dependent 
uh, on anything uh, that you can do. It's just how we are. When we do, so this is a very important statement. I'll actually, I'll post this in for you guys as well. When we do the behavior that allows us to belong, we feel innocent. When we do the behavior that violates this belonging, we feel guilty. You see? So staying sick feels innocent if you grew up around someone you love who was sick. Being healthy, we feel guilty because we're no longer part of it. There is no exception to this. There's no exception. When a child cannot heal or fix the family, fix the parents, it does one thing. It says, just, I'll take it all on them. If I can't help you, just give it to me. I'll figure it out for you because I love you so much. When a child cannot heal, help, or fix a family, the child takes on the family pain in order to help them you see, to honor them and to be one of them. Aren't we fascinating creatures, us human beings? So what happened to, to myself recently, this got put in a spotlight, a big spotlight. I'm in the end result of, of growing this, this amazing movement and and taking this company, you know, to its next level. And I realized and got the truth that I've just got so many smart, talented, capable people around me, you know, Hannah, uh, Scott, uh, you know, Alexi, Mia, we got just, we just got so many, uh, Rochelle, who's on this call, and, and they're ready to step into to their, to their big place. And so I'm choosing that. And as I'm choosing that, I'm allowing Rochelle and Hannah and Alexi and Mia and just all these amazing people step into their genius and become the stars. And all of a sudden, I feel this depression come over me. And I'm like, why am I sad about this? This is brilliant. There's James Wellington off presenting that. There's all these things and I'm feling sad. But what, what would that be? You know, $20 million company beautiful why like what well, doesn't make any sense living i love what i do why do i feel sad and i was like that's weird so i did the process we're going to do today and i realized oh that's right the rule there's a rule there the rule is is to honor my family i must be on the tools the hard working head down on the tools if you're not on the tools you don't deserve it If you're not on the tools, Duncan, you don't deserve it. And I get, I feel energy as I tell you the truth. And so I look at it and I go, oh, gee, look at that. That's a good topic for your next session. <laughs> look at that. Look at that, Duncan. Wow. So I go into it and I do the process that we do today and I look at it and I realize, wow, why would I have that? That's not what serves me. That's not true. Why would I hold on to that and stop all of these amazing people going to their genius and taking this movement to, to what it needs to be? The only reason I would is this misguided contract that I will be like you, dad. Dad, I'll be like you. I will work hard no matter what. I'll be like you. I'll be head down. I'll be a hard worker, even though I'm financially free. I think Harry and I have 80 years available to us, but I'll be a hard worker no matter what. Because I want to be like you. I was like, dang. Let's, let's shift this. So what's interesting is sitting in our field is a unconscious desire to create safety and belonging. And we set up contracts and rules to make sure we do that. And if we violate those rules, we feel guilty. We feel guilty. We feel we feel all sorts of things that we don't want to feel. But when we do it, 
when we work hard, when we do what's in alignment with that which we have created, we feel great, even if it's in complete conflict with that which we want to create. Can I get some feedback? Who's enjoying today? No one's wasting their time here. There's no good reason that you don't have what it is that you want to have in your life, except for the good reasons your unconscious has, uh, has decided on a long time ago. There's no good reason you don't have it. There's people not as smart as you, not been on the planet as long as you, not as anything as you, and they have it. Then there's all, there's every type of way to have it. There's no good reason, except for the good reason that you've created and held on to and chosen not to let go of because it feels safer to stick to suffering than it does to finally let go. It feels like you, you're obliged to be like that rather than to go for your end result. You live in two worlds. You can either live in the world where you are holding on to that which you have been and, and just pretending that you want these things, or you find new ways to honor your family and have what you want, because isn't it true? All of their suffering and all of our suffering, what do we always think to ourselves? We always want to have our children to have a better existence than we have. Yes or no? We want our children to have a better existence than we have. We want to, we love the feeling. Who likes the feeling of doing something really, really, really good and then others that they care about being able to benefit from it? Tell me, does that feel good? Does it feel good? Doesn't it? It feels good that you did something, you worked hard and you get to contribute and others get... So what if all of the suffering, all of the challenges, all of the illness, all of the pain for everyone that's come in your line, what if by you creating the most abundant, joyful, love-filled life, you give them the big victory and make it all worth it? What if their pain, maybe their death, maybe their illness, maybe their struggle, what if it was actually only worth it if you do create a life you love? What if you're actually the success that they've been waiting to celebrate with? And what if you continuing to struggle makes their struggle and pain and demise and frustration and illness not worth it. What if they made their life an example of what not to do and here you are just repeating it? How good would it feel to know that by creating a life you love and living your fullest expression and everything you've desired ever, how good would it feel to know that that is the absolute best way to honor any struggle or pain or frustration or sacrifice or short-lived life or or heartache or abuse, what if that was the best way to honor it? Hey, Chris here again. I hope you really enjoyed that session. Obviously, it was streamed live to our Magnet Mind Masterclass uh, coaching program. If you'd like to be involved in that program, please do reach out. Uh, we do have spaces you can uh, apply for and you can join. So do let us know if it's something for you. And again, thank you so much for your support. Subscribe, like, and share this content so we can reach millions of people just like you and help them become conscious creators. Have a great day. Stay super conscious.